Excellent. Thank you for the, such a nice introduction, Atif. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and the, um, all the attendees today. Um, and you know, look forward to having further discussions after this about artificial intelligence. Um, I can. I'll be taking questions at the end, and I think probably if you put them in the chat. Um, during the talk, I can look at them at the end quickly and we can try to get some done. And I'll save some time at the end for that. Uh, so today, um, what I'd really like for you to come away with is um, some skills to help think about deploying and being successful with artificial intelligence. And you can think of that as a general term, using data and analytics in some sort of application be that in an academic setting or an industry. Um, but that's become sort of my passion over my career is trying to help bring advanced technology, especially in the computing sciences, to people that can benefit in some way. And that's how I started um, in an operations research laboratory at the University of Nottingham, and then at General Electric, as a team shared. And then went to do entrepreneurship for the last six years with two different startups. And so, um, that's the overarching goal. Hopefully you can come away with some skills to bring towards application and making impact with the techniques that you're studying. Now, I will put a little bit of a caveat in that because this is an academic uh, setting and a lot of the applications that I've done over the years that I would consider to be artificial intelligence, we don't publish as papers. They're maybe not breaking ground or they're not um, new algorithms, or maybe it's just something that we weren't interested or had the time to publish. But today I'm picking a slightly more complicated solution that we were able to do publications on because of your academic uh, pedigrees. I thought that would be more interesting. I just want to put that caveat that not every applied AI system or applied decision support in industry is an academic paper or journal articles uh, kinds of things. So hopefully you can find something of interest in both topics. And so while I'm here in Seattle on a rainy uh, morning, uh, I appreciate everybody for staying late in your day and, and watching. So hopefully this is somewhat interesting and entertaining for you as well. Okay, let me share my slides. Okay, so. Hopefully, you can see these. So today we're going to talk about architecting for success. Oops, and using a mineral exploration example with an auto ML solution. So first, I want to um, share a few definitions um, just to make sure we're on the same page. And these are just pretty vanilla definitions off the internet. So AI, theory and development of computer systems to perform tasks that normally requires human intelligence. I'm gonna talk about document classification. So this is the process of assigning categories or classes or labels to documents, to text, to make them easier to manage, analyze, and find. Automated machine learning, the process of automating the very time-consuming and iterative tasks in developing machine learning models. And a lot of machine learning models are really just statistical and analysis of data, preparing data and analyzing data. And then the last piece where I'm sure everybody's heard this phrase, phrase architecture, I'm gonna use this to describe making a plan for something that is a, or a complex or carefully designed structure of something. And so architecture is very important in computer science, especially in industry and in application. And I'm going to talk about why architecture should be considered more in artificial intelligence. So I'm going to go through these uh, three main points and then one takeaway at the end. So we're going to talk about the problem that we're facing with using our technologies and our studies and our science to deliver value. So a lot of AI projects fail. Uh, present a solution that I believe has worked for me over the years, and that's about archety architecting AI solution. I'm going to use a, an example from um, a real project with a real customer where we deployed it and they tried it, 
we ended up um, not, they ended up not bringing this into their production environment after several months of, of um, trying it due to our as a company decision to pull the, that product off. And then the last thing I'm going to show you is this uh, open source or a Creative Commons license uh, product that I made called the AI Decision Canvas that you're more than uh, welcome to try to use that in your future work. Okay, so also because this is an academic setting, I thought it'd be fun to have a little homework. So this is totally optional, um, but if you have worked on some model or data analysis where you thought it could be useful for someone, you thought maybe I could turn this into a startup, maybe I could turn this into a cool phone app uh, and release it, maybe it's some sort of AI behind, or analysis of just data that you thought you could put out there and get use out of it, or somebody could use it. Write it down now. Uh, while I'm talking, think about what those might be. Write some notes down. And at the end, try to use this AI decision canvas. Try to sketch it out. Try to form a full architecture for your solution. And if you'd like, uh, send it to me. I'll share my email at the end, and I'll try to provide some feedback. Okay, I'm going to skip the, most of this because Atif did such a great uh, and uh, nice uh, job uh, introducing. Um, but the main point is I've been working in mostly applications of AI for my whole career. I managed to stay in with a foot in academia, continue to do papers and some other kinds of roles. But my passion has always been about trying to build solutions that I could deploy and people could use. So. I'm going to look at a couple quotes here about artificial intelligence. So Gartner, the famous research organization, predicts um, that through the end of this year, a large percentage of AI projects won't deliver outcomes due to various reasons, one of them being the teams responsible for managing them. So, uh, an article in the Sloan Review of MIT quoted seven out of 10 companies surveyed had no or minimal impact from AI. And that among the 90% that have made some investment, fewer than two of five report business gains. So the uh, famous data science uh, online um, site, Katie Nuggets, uh, did a, had a paper contribution where they interviewed various folks and the majority of data scientists who work in industry felt that only from zero to 20% of models generated were to deployed have gotten, were, de were deployed. So more than 80% of their projects don't even get to a deployed ML model. And then from a research paper, a journal article that was published entitled Failure of AI Projects, Understanding the Critical Factors. There's a really interesting quote here or a statement from the paper was that they cited the false expectations or lack of resources that were encountered. These are non-technical factors that were encountered during the project. And that um, a lot of these things just were not anticipated because they weren't appropriately or considered in the planning of the AI project. So most AI projects fail. And so we looked at some examples from some recent research. You can find plenty of others, just search AI failures, and you'll find lots of examples. Um, you'll also see lots of examples if you look around the ethical discussions of AI systems today, which has become a very hot topic, um, highly debated. And amongst those debates are all kinds of projects that fail because of their um, ethical problems. And some of the large conferences, I was reading a great article today in The New Yorker, um, uh, talk a lot about or focus a lot about now on the societal impacts having to do with um, bias data, bias decisions, ethics um, of those systems. So there's a lot of pressure put on why AI projects fail. And those uh, reasons that were often cited are the unclear business objectives, poor data quality, but then the lack of collaboration between teams. So out of the three of these things, you know, only data quality is kind of loosely tied to what people, where people spend most of their time, which is with doing data analytics. So um, one of the kind of interesting projects that was going on when I was at GE Research, which is in upstate New York, 
was the IBM Watson project that was happening just, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 miles away at one of the IBM uh, research facilities and then across the Northeast with all their collaborate, collaborators. And I'm not going to read this statement. There's plenty of, of uh, information out there about this. But this was this example of this really interesting, cool system that the IBM team made to play this game of Jeopardy. And um, it was a very cool problem. It, they worked very, very hard, lots of money. I think it was a major success in terms of the Jeopardy challenge that they were facing. Um, and while I was up there, we got to um, some of the IBM team were um, uh, connected with the GE research folks or with RPI, the university where a lot of them went. And so we had a lot of seminars back and forth from Dave Ferrucci and some of the other people involved in that project. And so when it went to industry and had lots of challenges, it was surprising, but not so surprising uh, because it wasn't, that wasn't the problem that Watson was made for. It wasn't made for healthcare. It was made to do play Jeopardy and trying to translate it lacked a certain amount of planning, certain amount of understanding of the healthcare problems they were trying to solve. And it has been sort of a, a fantastic kind of disaster for IBM over the last several years. So the second claim that I'm making in this talk, that I hope that you agree with at the end, is that the solution to a lot of this, these challenges for artificial intelligence and data science project failures is around creating the right architecture and doing that upfront. And so, you know, just to kind of step back from that a little bit is, you know, architecture is usually a topic, at least in the computer sciences, that we only really talk about from the software engineering point of view, distributed systems, um, you know, building architecture for various like real-time streaming systems. There's a lot of interesting things, but when it comes to artificial intelligence, data science, analytics, we usually spend most of the time understanding the statistics, understanding the methods, doing examples with clean data. And when you get into industry, there is actually a lot of similarities between how you might do your analytics in, in um, school, is that in industry, a lot of time is spent with data science teams working together in kind of little pods, being given challenge problems where they work on the data. It's not that typical in industry for data science teams to be um, of significant size, but co-located with the business teams and understanding customer problems and the business decisions. So it's not, it's not always true, but that's typically the case. And so what that means is that a lot of the, the planning that goes around creating a solution, while software engineers think about it, Data scientists, machine learning, artificial intelligence researchers or engineers tend to not be given the opportunity or the training to think much about the overall architecture of what they're building. And so the architecture really um, is a plan to help you do a couple things. One, it's to understand the customer and the decision being made. So it's really important to thoroughly understand what that is. The second is that how do you address feedback and learning is of the utmost important in most AI applications. So the way to think about that is when you build a model for something, that's just the beginning. It's just the baseline. When you deploy it, things change. Your data will change. It will, in statistics, we'll talk about that as drift. The users and the applications might change. And those unintended consequences or unplanned for consequences today are where most of what we read about ethical problems in AI occurring is that it was great intentions at the beginning to build a recommender, to build an image classifier, to build a, a search engine uh, result ranker. But once folks deploy that, people start using it, then the data changes. The model doesn't know how to deal with that new data because it's never it was never trained on it and then things go awry. And so not thinking about the life cycle and thinking about what happens when people start using the models, how does feedback come in? How will you learn to keep the model and keep the overall system doing what you intend it to be? Uh, the third point about creating architecture is um, also very important from the data science and the analytics point of view is that by having an architecture of what you're doing, you can think about 
what data is needed, not what's available. So most, um, I would say, academic in the computer science uh, analysis and computer science fields where you're doing machine learning models, start with available data because getting data sets is difficult. But to contrast that, if you go across the university to maybe the social sciences, most of their effort is about gathering data and then doing very simple statistics. And you can see this dichotomy of the need and the focus of answering science questions, generating and acquiring data for that. Maybe it's doing a 10 years longitudinal study to collect the right data about people to make some observations about health progression. In the machine learning side, we're very um, eager to build models. And so we go and we look for available data. What data is out there that I can plug into my models right away? I can build an, a machine learning system right away. And as long as it's close enough, I can fuzz, I can blur my eyes when I present it to leadership or when I try to write a paper. But again, it might not be the data that you need. I give an example of this from the General Electric days where we were um, assembled for GE Transportation, which was their rail business. They made rail engines, um, trucks that go underneath the rail cars. And we were discussing some of the analytics problems or challenges being faced to predict failure of the trucks, of the wheels and the systems that are underneath the rail cars. And one of the senior engineers who was kind of like the CTO of the research center in, in a, for the whole GE company, he raised his hand and said, look, you're telling me that we don't have good failure data. And so we're not able to predict real failures. And we're, instead, we're, we're left with all these false positives. He said, what we're going to do is we're going to run our engines and we're going to cause failures. We're going to cause the failures that we need to predict. We're going to engineer the failures so that you get the right sensor data and we can have a great alarming system. And I was, when I first heard that, I thought that's really cool and amazing because they're going to spend a lot of money to get the data that they need, a lot of uh, weight, a lot of um, parts that are going to be destroyed, a lot of time spent, a lot of other um, engineering costs. But they realized that they need the data. There's no other way around it. And so that's, that's what they went and did. And then the last piece about the architecture is that if you've ever worked on a, a deploy or an AI system that's going to go into production, there's actually a whole group of people that you need to work with. Many times what happens is that data science gets a bunch of data at the beginning, works on it for several weeks or several months, and then hands off the model, at that point, the teams try to figure out what to do with it. And this isn't the most um, efficient way to run projects, especially when there's a budget and, other, and people have other priorities. So one of the great things about having a plan is that you can map out what are all the different pieces that need to be developed. People can agree up front about the interfaces, agree about data interfaces, user, interfa user experiences, but most importantly, once you have a plan in front of you, most of the time you can identify where there's a key risk, like an assumption that is being made. We can get this data or the model can achieve the necessary accuracy of 85% or something. And when you do that plan, you can look at that and say, you know what, let's go after that key risk. Let's make sure that we can get the data before we do anything else. So it can also help you save time and effort that might uh, be wasted later. Okay, so um, that's the second part of the talk, the claim of using an AI architecture. And so now we're gonna get into this case study and spend about 20 minutes looking at this. So this is a real case study. I generalized a little bit of it. Um, and again, this was based on a um, system, an AI kind of platform system that was deployed and, and we're giving to customers. I believe there is still one customer using it, but after we made this and deployed it and they were doing a proof of concept and using it, um, uh, us as a company, this is a previous company I worked at, decided to kind of to pause this and to work on a different platform. Um, and, and, and so 
this actual application didn't last for too long out in the industry. I just want to make that caveat since I always like, I don't ever like reading papers that say something was deployed to find out that it wasn't deployed, which is a big deal. Okay, so what is this problem, mineral exploration? So for different kinds of, of things, and you can think about oil um, companies as, as a typical one, but you're reading a lot today about uh, cobalt nickel, probably in the papers, about mining those and trying to find um, other deposits underground. So it applies to all kinds of natural resources. Um, so typically what happens is that companies, large companies like BP, Shell, um, they will purchase land rights to drill and to whatever is recovered that they basically own those mineral rights. And so they purchase those rights um, and the risks are very high that nothing is there or what is there underground isn't easily recoverable either because it's not cost effective, um, it's too, um, it's too, um, take, will take too long or they just have other priorities. And so the risk is high. They purchase this land and mineral rights uh, but they're taking on a lot of risk that they have to go underground. And if you have ever uh, worked on oil and gas projects or mining projects, one of the interesting things is, is that while we understand a lot about what's under the earth, it's very, very macro level. And so drilling holes is, and looking at what comes up is still really the only way that people know for sure what's there. And so, and even that, the knowledge is imperfect. And so there's a lot of uh, planning and research that goes on before somebody actually puts a drill rig on a, a, on a location and begins that process. But there are similar and other mining activities that have usually happened nearby. And so they have surrogate or um, like data that they can analyze to try to get an idea. And again, I always find science a very cool, um, and especially geology, a cool topic. One of the examples I had was from when the two continents, um, Africa and South America, North America, were closer together. You know, of course, they shared similar geologies. So as they separated, you know, millions of years later, when they're mining on one side, they might refer to the geology on the other side because it has very similar types of formations due to deposits that happened when they were nearby. Stuff like that, it's so cool. So they can look at the data and companies often acquire the historical data, either through acquiring a smaller mining company, a drilling operation, or another um, natural uh, resource company that has a lot of the, this historical data about those previous attempts to analyze the geologies and, and mines, wells. But the data is a mess. I mean, PDFs, old document for, formats, you know, over the years of, of creating different records, it's, it's evolved so quickly that one of their largest problems is that they will get, you know, either actual physical records or huge drives of digitized data. And somebody has to go through and label what everything is to begin organizing and analyzing. So the challenge that we were given, this is a startup that I worked at before, was given all of this data and every time they go to a different location the data you're analyzing is different given all this data get it organized get it classified get it labeled so their geologists can go in and very quickly start analyzing the key data that they need some of that they're very specific about failures to equipment the geologies the analysis of seismic imaging and so it's a, it became a document classification task. Now, this is a typical approach that I have seen over and over again in, in industry. And um, it's, I mean, it's probably what you'd see if you go out today in a lot of industrial companies and, and other types of companies who are trying to apply data science, data analytics, is that somebody in the business will have identified this opportunity. Maybe they just worked on a project where they had to do this analysis and they thought, wow, that was really a pain. Let's see if we can have some data science group make this easier for us. So the data science team in their annual planning has identified this as a project. They're given the data that's probably somebody just worked on where they had actually gone through and labeled everything by hand. They might spend several weeks analyzing the data, cleaning it, 
changing document formats. There's some really not fun stuff that data scientists do, like PDF conversion to text. It's an endless mind storm of, of challenges. It's no fun at all. Um, and they make some assumptions, like the, the, the business just did this activity. They did the labeling. So you can assume the labels are correct, and they'll make that assumption that they're correct, but they don't. They're not always correct. And there are plenty of errors that humans make because they're humans or because they just didn't have time to correct things in that data. And the data scientists, because they don't do this task, they don't understand perhaps how significantly the data and the labels change for every different field study. So typically what happens after this period of ana analyzing data is somebody reports out the model accuracy. They provide the code. Usually it's a lot of Python scripts and R scripts. Um, and maybe if you're lucky and you're on the IT side having to deploy it or the ML engineering side, maybe you'll actually get some of the, the code that was used to pre-process data, pre data, but usually it's just in, in PowerPoints and it's just documented somewhere. So when IT or the, the um, deployment um, group gets those models, they often don't understand how the data was pre-processed. And this is a huge one that happens um, uh, where it's just very common once you get a data set to start doing cleaning steps to make it fit into your, your um, analysis packages, your frameworks. But those, those steps are, are super critical that the people deploying it have to replicate those exactly. And so that's a, a big common failure or pitfall. And then once the model's deployed, you're never deploying that model on the data that you're given for training. It's always deployed on the future fields, the future text, the future classification problems. And so usually there's a big hit in accuracy. And that accuracy, like I mentioned before, typically hasn't been thought through, that accuracy change about how would you learn to improve it or customize it for the new data? How is the data drifted? How will your model handle it? And because the, the business users or the experts, they weren't usually involved with that whole process that went to go build the model. They don't understand exactly what it's doing. Is it doing regressions? Is it doing some kind of binary classification? Are there confidence intervals available? Does it create probabilities or is it just a, a, a binary sort of labeling system? And so when they don't understand that and they see errors, this usually puts the project to an end. So I would say out of these things, you can see that the accuracy or the technology choices aren't usually that the, the cause of failure. It's usually a communication issue, documentation issue, and a planning issue. And so um, back when I was in General Electric and used to have to do a lot of these workshops, we might run six to 12 different AI projects within my lab. There's anywhere from 15 to 20 uh, PhDs in that group. We used to run a lot of projects every year, and it would they would come and go during the year. And they always involved starting the project by talking with the business teams who had the problem and who were sort of sponsoring the work. We would agree on what was the challenge, what was the system going to look like, how we, we deliver. Sometimes this went great, sometimes not so well. Sometimes projects were successful. And of course, just like here, a lot of them didn't, weren't successful. And so... I came up with these kind of three big pieces to work through when we did these workshops. And then at the first startup I went to, they also had a workshopping kind of process because we were delivering a platform. And so we couldn't customize and build the, the sort of initial system for them, um, which you have to do when you sell a platform, um, is we needed a workshop. And so I worked with the CTO, one of the co-founders, to come up with some ideas on how to do that. And I created a, a, a kind of a framework on how we might capture that, but that's tailored for artificial intelligence solutions. That's what we were selling. So I created this framework, and then that's what you're seeing today, um, is this, this kind of loose framework that isn't meant to be a, a super prescriptive, but it's more of a, a framework to help give you um, a kind of crutches to ask the right question, think about the problem in different ways, and then ultimately come up with some kind of plan where you can start collaborating together. And it's broken into these three um, pieces, largely. Understanding the decision, the strategy. This is where you work with the experts, with the people who know the problem. And usually, 
you can you you know this is true. I remember I think one of the early projects that Atif and I worked on was using AI evolutionary algorithms to model financial stock prices. And uh, then I remember doing that thinking, this is cool. I don't know anything about stock trading, but I bet it's not this simple. And over the years, I've dabbled in it. But now today, I work in a startup, the third year, where we work a lot with securities and stocks and other kinds of securities. And yeah, it's a lot more complicated than the time series of price movements. So this first part is asking the experts and understanding how does the business do it today? How do they make decisions? Where does judgment come in? How do their experts learn? How do they take feedback from failed or successful decisions and incorporate it? The businesses, believe me, if they're successful in funding your project, they do this today. It might not be apparent, but you know, working inside of GE Power where they're maintaining power plants, they have a whole operation of people looking at failures, looking at alarms, building models, trying to predict what's the cost of those issues. And it's, it, there's a lot of activity that happens there. And so they do this today. They're looking for you to understand how they do it and how you can bring more capabilities, more predictive models to, to bear. The second piece is around breaking the decision down. And this is largely a data science function because you know the technologies. You understand how training data is used. And this is where understanding what the objective function is, what you would train with, how would you build the first model, how would you take feedback from the user or from some other system, like a pricing algorithm that's selling things, how would you take that data and update your recommendation or your predictive models? And then the last piece is where you want to bring in the machine learning engineers, where maybe the data scientists have thought about, this is the kind of model that we want to make. Here we need to get user data from the user. We need to fold that in and deploy it. This is a deep learning model. We need to run it on a cluster. All these things is where the machine learning engineers can then help you do the more of the software architecture where you're defining core functions that will flow data from one thing to another, having points where you're gonna to have to have a user interface. And so together, this is basically what makes up this architecture for an AI solution. Okay, so going back into our, um, our problem of the mining exploration and document classification, and to be, um, um, clear here, this is a pretty common document cl document classifier problem. And I've worked on lots of these over the years and they all model something kind of similar. And But usually we didn't use AutoML. The AutoML is kind of cool because it's this problem gets replicated from one field or one mining opportunity to the next where the data is very, very different. So in the first step about understanding the decision, the strategy, I'm using the word labeler Labeler here is like you can think of it as the person who's doing it by hand. So this is what we're learning from the expert is that for each document section, they're applying the best label that describes what the, what the topic is. So the drilling mud, is it about the blowout preventer? Is it about uh, drill bits doling? Is it a pump performance issue? Is it deviations from plan? These are all core topics that you would find in a field report um, that's coming from a, a mining operation. So they, they go and they look at the section and they start applying labels to that so they can be indexed and, and recalled later. And the labeler, what they're doing usually is they're just looking at the text, maybe headers, because they don't want to read absolutely everything. They get used to seeing repeated um, metadata or repeated headers um, throughout when you start getting into those different documents. And so they can start to move fast and they can kind of make predictions without looking at everything in the minus detail. And the key inference um, that they're making is that as they start to generate these kind of rules, and a lot of times what they would do is make very simple rule patterns, like if the text has these phrases or if the section header has these things, and start to um, deploying them, like in an Excel sheet or something like that. Um, they're looking for the rules that are the simplest, the least likely to have edge cases, but they still get good accuracy. And so one of the examples that they showed us was this massive Excel book. Um, that had every section from thousands of documents put in as cells. And then they were going through in the next column, adding the labels and then using little uh, rules, little heuristics in Excel to auto generate the labels and then going and checking if they look good or not. And then they would just kind of keep iterating that. So they're kind of building little classifiers doing that. And that's a, a, a kind of a typical um, example. And so what the labeler is doing is 
in that process, they're learning how to um, label for different document sets, looking at what the headline patterns are, the metadata, some of the phrases that are very common for a certain um, geology or, or geography that they're, they're looking to mine in. And so once that is captured in that understanding, then we look at the, the, what the labeler um, or the data science models might be doing. And so again, and this, um, we know that from what we learned from that team, a natural mapping to that process is that we probably need to start with some sections labeled. So we're gonna start now our labeler in this context is, is the algorithm, it's the data, the science, the modules, the code, where we're gonna need a couple examples probably to help bootstrap this. Because, because they're so different, we, and because maybe the, the classes themselves are going to be different based on what type of mineral, what type of natural resource they're going after, um, the, the classes, the labels are going to be different. So we're going to need some samples. We know that um, the raiders make mistakes, and that's okay, um, and that there is some notion of the replicability of the raiders. So that accuracy, if you had a couple of geologists label the documents differently, was became sort of like the target. That's how they were sort of measuring if the raiders were doing well enough. And the um, we want to express allow the users to express some preferences over certain rules to try first, and to like for example using a rule-based learner versus a neural net because they prefer the transparency of a rule-based system or like a decision tree over. Um, gradient boosted trees where it's a lot harder to, to wade through all those methods. And then there's a, a key aspect in here where you do some prediction and you're looking at which rules, which types of things worked well to then decide to replace or change your system and then iterate. So learning from the, the user, th this was the process, we started to map out how could the data science also do this. And so Maybe the other piece that I should mention here is that um, you can see what I'm doing a little bit here is I'm trying to match the data science algorithm, the data science process, the AI system process to how the experts do today. And there's and the reason is um, is that what I have learned over the years is that people in the engineering spaces and in industry healthcare, there is a reason for the process that they have. It may not be very obvious, and it may seem weird, for example, you know, that the that radiologist might first go in and start labeling sections in the image before they do any kind of um, um, analysis or any kind of decision about what things they're seeing in a, in a um, CT scan, for example. Um, likewise here, um, they, somebody would go through and label all these documents and get them all together. There's a reason they do these things, and by jumping, trying to jump around that and just say, well, you know, I'm going to make an AI system that just takes all your data, builds a massive model and spits you out the answer. It almost never works very well that way. So the best thing advice I would give is understand how people do their process today and then look for concrete places where you can bring data and analytics to help in a specific task. And that's going to be your best chance. And then maybe over time, some other tasks can be assisted also, but just you know, pay respect to the fact that people worked really hard over their careers to do this job well. And there's probably a reason. Sometimes there may be inefficient or there's other things going on. But there's probably a reason for it. And so that's why when we broke this problem down from the data science point of view, we tried to match what the, the, the people were doing. And then the last step of this is defining the functions and the interaction. So planning an end-to-end -end, um, function. We needed to be able to allow the expression of the data science. We needed to be able to um, build models. Uh, we need to be able to learn from just a few examples which parts of the models worked well and to how to incorporate if the we started getting some great results and the user looked at a partial or like a, a, a first result and it was a neural net and they said, you know what, that's not going to work for me because I just don't know what's happening. They can just say no more neural nets and the system needed to be able to take that into account. And then because everybody is time bound and some of these systems can keep improving little bits, little bits, and there's a big search space, we wanted to be able to make sure just like the labelers 
in the process today could decide we have a good enough solution that we could either set a target min accuracy or allow them to just say, pause, give me the best thing that you have today. So we built that architecture and it kind of looks a little bit like this where across the top is how people, this is the people process, but people are building labels, examining them, trying configuration. And then where can we have a user experience with the person, the expert, versus where can the machine, the robot um, process do a, a bunch of steps there. So we could map, we mapped out this architecture, talked to the teams about it, got their validation. So when we came to this, we realized auto ML was a great um, opportunity. And so I'm gonna go a little bit faster here because we actually have some papers that you can read if you're interested in the details. But generally, um, auto ML is just this machine learning um, process to automate some of those tricky decisions or time consuming decisions. Um, it was actually one of the first systems I published in 1998, I think, or 99, when I was a master's student doing a wrapper method using um, uh, clusters. And, and uh, back then we called them Beowulf machines, Beowulf clusters. Um, and so I've been kind of dabbling in, in, in and out of the space a long time. But there's some things that we didn't like about it, the black box nature of it, the uh, need for very large data sets, the long hours. So knowing what AutoML could do today and where there was some gaps, we set out to design a new one. And so what the architecture for this AutoML system was, was that we started by having a, a, a small set of data the user can um, label. We then look across the whole stack from pre-processing to prediction and learning, and we enable the ability to construct pipelines that go from the entire basically an IT stack because we wanted to avoid this problem of having different preprocessors bias algorithms later. And so we built a system that can generate a whole end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. And we allow the, the users, they can pause it, they can see it, the system exports a log of the best uh, models today that they can visual they could visualize. And then the labeler itself, as people add labels, those things get put right into the process. And so to do that, we defined, we used symbolic planning with reinforcement learning. And so the system that I'll um, breeze through here ignores some of the UI aspects. It was very platform specific kind of user interfaces that we had. Instead, this I'm just gonna talk about the AutoML algorithm here. And so the system uh, I mentioned uses use symbolic planning um, from an AI point of view to um, build pipelines of models. So, Rules allow the planner to understand when a, a component does what its goal is and what it outputs, so it can build that plan. And then reinforcement learning allowed us to reward different components in the plan based on the accuracy of the, the predictions that they were making. And then penalize for length, for accuracy, the planner would then generate new plans and would do this in a systematic way of sampling, try different techniques, find ones that worked well, add to them, try different techniques, add to them, so on. So it looks something like this, and these are some of the technologies if you're interested in, and I'll give the reference a bit um, in a little bit about the papers that use this. So we use the BC Action Language, we use a uh, Reasoner Klingo doing answer step programming, uh, Scikit-Learn, and then um, reinforcement R learning. And the environment looked um, a bit like this. So this was the ability to create these pipelines, take the rewards of the system, build models. This is all to mimic what the user was doing when they're labeling. So we wanna to try to keep mimicking that process. And one of the important things was that uh, we could output the learning that was happening so that the system and the user knew, was the system still doing something or was it a, a random chance? So this is just a little graph that we would put out in the logs to display to the user that showed learning parameters. And all it's really saying is we're spending time and we're learning different um, pipelines. And so like this TFIDF and truncated support vector machines as a preprocess of this pink one, it, the system decided that those aren't good things, that we're not learning anything. And so it stopped reinforcing it and it stops exploring with those parameters. This is a very busy meta learning chart, but again, this is in the paper. And then because we were only getting a small set of data to try this with, 
we went across a lot of UCI data and tried to be very comprehensive and saying, could we use this approach and learn good models on these very different data sets by the same process of labeling some data, building a model, labeling some more data. And then we also compared it with the Azure AutoML system back at the time, which in their, in their case was more, there wasn't a lot of configuration. It was mostly just dropping in the data set, running the AutoML and seeing what happened. And there's some great examples in here of total overfitting. Like when you see a 1.0, it's, it's really pointless kind of model. It's just overfitted to the data that was there. Um, so we were really happy about the approach and the accuracy and the fit to the system. And so this is a picture of what that canvas looks like. Um, and it has the same, you can see those same um, components of what the decision is, the decision strategy. Um, in the canvas, it has some more specific titles and sections and questions that try to ask that you can try to um, prompts to help you kind of think through it. In this bottom left section, the decision breakdown, this is um, actually I'm building upon a book called Prediction Machine that came out in 2018. Um, at the same time, I codified this section. I used to have a different step three, which was similar, but wasn't as nice. And so when this, sec when this um, book came out and released their Canvas as open source, I brought that in here and also wanted to keep a connection to this really interesting book. Um, these are by business uh, folks at the University of Toronto, where I believe was was where um, Yoshi Bengio was at when he did uh, his deep learning work and kind of helped create a lot of the hype and hyperbole around artificial intelligence there. So um, recommend that book. Okay, and so these are some of the papers um, that we did. The paper I just described is in this genetic programming theory and practice, um, where we also looked at um, Actually, I'm not sure if this is the right reference or not, but I tried to do something similar, with, but with genetic programming or evolutionary algorithms. Um, and the title or the technique was called PEARL, Integrating Symbolic Planning and Hierarchical Reinforcement Learning. And I had the pleasure of working with Fang Kai Yang, who is an employee of mine, and his former professor, Bo Lu, and a, and a PhD student, Daoming Lu, um, helped us and we collaborated, we shared data, they worked together, and we did some papers. And then together we did a couple more studies and then um, Bo and the team at Auburn went on to do several other things. Uh, Fang Kai went from the previous startup I was at and is a very successful researcher doing reinforcement learning and deep learning at NVIDIA for their um, driverless car technologies. All right, so in summary, what I hope that you came away with was that for AI solutions, centering the understanding around the customer and the decision. So re always keep them at the middle of what you're doing. Don't get lost in data, cool new techniques, what's the hottest new deep learning model with a billion layers that uh, takes 100 million years to compute. You know, Don't get stuck in that if you're wanting to make impact. Understand the customer and the decision that you're trying to help. Focus your, your, your learning on there. Even so much as when you map and create your system, it's okay to start to try to mimic what they're doing and provide just pieces. Let them stay involved, let them stay in the loop, and then deploy a system that can help them. Always focus on the data that's needed, not the data that you have. What data do you really need to answer this question? And if you want a, a reminder, just keep your friendly social science department in mind when you're thinking about building a new data a model and you have some data that's almost there, just remember that sometimes they spend their whole career just collecting data. And um, so maybe what we need to do in the AI field is to think a little bit more about spending the effort to collect the right data. And then the last piece is AI is a complex system that involves humans, human judgment, has societal impacts. I don't know of any complex system that we have today that's successful where an architecture isn't a critical piece of that. So by opening up and by thinking about the AI and the data and analytics solution as a complex system that requires an architecture, I think it will help, and I've seen it help, teams collaborate across the users to the business, to the deployment team, to not only build the system more successfully and efficiently, but also to identify those main risks early. 
and I'll stress, you know, one of the reasons I mentioned I was looking at the AI and ethics work is that I was asked to write an opinion piece about it. And as I did more research into some of the most worrying aspects of AI and ethics around biases, around populations of people, so much of it, in my opinion, comes back to the lack of thoughtful planning and architecture around what are you trying to achieve? How do people do it today? How do people avoid biases today? How can the AI system take that learning and bring it into avoiding making systematic mistakes down the line? So architecture. All right, here's a picture of some of the people on the team that um, I had the pleasure of working with. Um, Alexander, I, I hired into my new startup and we're having lots of fun together. So um, again, here's the homework um, that I mentioned before. My email address is steven at noonum.com. So again, if there's a model that you're thinking about turning into a startup, maybe you're working at a company, um, you're um, brainstorming ideas, or you just want to make a, a cool personal project, you know, I would encourage you to think about that architecture. Think about how you can go through those different steps from the point of view of the people doing that process today. How can you help them? And, you know, when I do those architectures, I start with just a couple sentences or a few words in each box. And when I look step back and I look at it, usually I always say, oh, wow, that makes no sense. Like I can't go from here to here. I just can't connect those. That was a really bad thing. Or the model is predicting one thing and what I actually needed was something else. So I've always found it helpful to do that in, in, some, in some regard. So if you want to try doing that, I'll do my best to provide some feedback if I can. To send them to Stephen Newham. You can do them whatever format that you'd like. I'll try to help. Okay, and that's all I have uh, for today. So thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Atif. Uh, maybe the last plug is this. I put this armillary sphere here because um, I thought it was a really cool astronomical tool from history. And I love. I have a, a fun 3D printer that I like to do. And Thingiverse is a source of all kinds of cool scientific instruments. So if you're interested in doing something in your free time, uh, definitely check it out. Center the customer in the middle. Look at the, what they do and uh, build your AI system.